Welcome, everyone, to the Southern Rockies Landscape Conservation Cooperative webinar. My name is Mary McFadden. I'll be hosting today's event. I am the Communications and Science Outreach Specialist for the Southern Rockies LCC. With us today is Lindsay Reynolds. Lindsay's presentation is on climate change and repairing forest communities, implications for small streams in the Upper Colorado River Basin. Before we start, I do have a few items to go over with you all. Um, just so you know, everyone is on mute for now. At the end of Lindsay's presentation, you'll be able to ask questions via phone or by typing in your questions into the chat box um, and sending them to me, the host. This webinar is being recorded, and I'll have that recording available for you on the Southern Rockies LCC website within a week. And that's it for the housekeeping stuff. I would now like to introduce Lindsay Reynolds. Lindsay is a riparian ecologist whose research centers on plants, eco-hydrology, climate change, and invasions. She is currently a research scientist in the biology department at Colorado State University and at the USGS Fort Collins Science Center. Recently, she has focused on how river hydrology and geomorphology influence adjacent plant communities, often in the context of future climate change, river regulation, and exotic species invasions in Western North America. Welcome, Lindsay. Thank you, Mary, and thank you everyone for tuning in today. And today I'm gonna to talk about a big project of ours through the Southern Rockies LCC, um, looking at climate change and riparian forest communities, and the implications for small streams in the upper Colorado River Basin. So, Backing up a step, um, the broad picture of climate change in the western U.S., as um, I'm sure you all know and are familiar with, there is that we have um, undoubtedly increasing carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, increasing temperatures. However, the models have been equivocal as far as um, long-term changes in precipitation. Some models show slight increases, some show decreases. However, the increasing temperatures are likely to, um, regardless of how precipitation goes, are likely to incre increase in evaporative demand and overall um, increase aridity and drought throughout the western U.S. and especially the southwestern U.S. One consequence of this warming and drying um, is less snow and earlier snow melt timing in the mountains and longer, drier summers. So what does this mean for riparian ecosystems? <clears throat> Changes in temperature, precipitation, and carbon dioxide will have both direct and indirect effects on riparian ecosystems. So some of the direct effects of climate change include effects on growth, survival, reproduction, water status, phenology, effects on species distribution, so oftentimes shifts higher in elevation and further north shifts in community composition, and changes in trophic interactions. The indirect effects of climate change on riparian systems will be mediated by stream flow. So changes in the climate that in turn affect stream flow will then um, in turn affect riparian ecosystems. So things like timing of high and low flows, magnitude of high and low flows, Inundation, so where and when floodplains are inundated. Water temperatures, in most cases, are going to be going up. And geomorphic changes associated with stream flow changes. So all of these will uh, loop back and affect some of these important um, key components of riparian ecosystems. Today and in this project, I'm going to be focusing on how low flows and how low flow hydrology shapes riparian ecosystems. So what does climate change mean for riparian restoration? In a lot of cases uh, where land managers and policymakers are planning restoration, um, a, a lot of folks are starting to incorporate climate change in their thinking. And climate restoration can actually ameliorate climate change through several different uh, processes. So, so through restoring environmental flows, that can help ameliorate 
uh, climate change for riparian ecosystems, restoring geomorphic complexity and floodplain connectivity. So in places where a stream may have been channelized or simplified, um, trying to restore some of that geomorphic complexity can help. <clears throat> restoring habitat diversity. And then all of these things can lead to um, increased resiliency of riparian and stream ecosystems in the face of climate change. So some things we could think about considering uh, when we're planning restoration include climate projections and scenarios for a given location, stream flow projections and scenarios for a given location, and then in turn how target species and target communities may shift under climate change. And then importantly, the various uncertainties um, associated with, with different climate projections. So understanding for a given location um, what, what, what are the error bars around projections and estimates of future climate and hydrologic scenarios? And then um, coming up with alternatives for you know, sort of a range of ideas and, and uh, for a given location. So today I'm going to focus um, in the context of restoration of how target species and target communities, and I'm going to be talking about riparian plant communities, how these species and communities may shift under climate change and under future conditions. So how will target species and communities shift under climate change? And um, one way to do this is, is through a various suite of tools that uh, manager or restoration planner might use. We can identify genotypes that are better adapted for future conditions. So if the future conditions are wetter, find species that are adapted for wet situations. If they're drier, find species that are adapted for drier conditions. We can use models of riparian communities to identify functional groups. So groups or suites or guilds of species that will perform better under future conditions. We can look to regional species lists that include relative tolerances and adaptations to different environmental conditions. So for example, the USDA plants database um, includes uh, key, key characteristics of each species. And so regional species lists that have these different uh, sort of strengths and weaknesses of different species can be useful. We can also look to local analog ecosystems for, eco for examples of appropriate plant communities under, under future conditions. So for example, we're working at site A and we want to do a restoration of the riparian area in site A and site A is projected to get drier in the future. Then let's look to some neighboring sites that are already drier. So for example, if site A is, is a perennial stream and it has a certain kind of hydrograph then let's look to a nearby stream that is um, a little bit drier, a little bit lower mean annual flows, lower peaks, uh, and look at what is growing on that neighboring stream as an example of what might do well at Site A in the future. Mm -hmm. So our work uh, was focused in the upper, upper Colorado River Basin. This is a map of the Southern Rockies LCC, and, and then I'm going to um, insert uh, it, with the purple outline, the outline of the Upper Colorado River Basin. So the um, Upper Colorado includes um, a lot of the Southern Rockies LCC. Uh, it also includes a little bit of Southern Wyoming. But it's mostly uh, Western Colorado and Eastern Utah. And it's, um, primarily the Colorado Plateau in this region and uh, the High Rockies and Uinta Wasatch Ranges. So for this region in particular, the background on climate hydrology is that we've already observed um, and also projected by models to have warming temperatures in this region. We are forecast to have more frequent, longer, and more severe droughts in this region in the future. Stream flows in late spring and summer have already decli declined. Again, that's as part of the shifting of snow melt earlier in the year as well. And also mean annual stream flow is projected to decrease by 6 to 25% over the next 100 years in the southwest. So in general, a picture of, of drying and, and lower stream flows in the future. 
So our working hypotheses for this particular research was that first, in arid and semi-arid regions of the western U.S., where intermittent streams are common, minimum flows will decrease and some perennial streams will shift to intermittent stream flow regimes under climate-driven changes in precipitation runoff and increases in evaporation. So uh, with this hydrologist, first hydrologic hypothesis, I'm going to focus on this idea that some perennial streams will shift to intermittent streams. And then our second working hypothesis has to do with the riparian plants. So changes in minimum flow volume and duration will then affect stream-dependent communities such as riparian plants, stream rivers, and fish. And, and we focus on the riparian plants. So our research questions were, what is the potential for streams in the upper Colorado to shift from perennial to intermittent under a warmer climate? And second, how will riparian plants in this region respond to changes in low flow? So the first piece of our research was hydrolog a hydrologic analysis, and the second part was a riparian plant community analysis. So for this first hydrologic analysis, we did a stream gauge analysis of historical flow data. We selected 115 stream gauges across the basin, and we selected gauges according to their, um, the size of the stream. So we did not include large rivers. We didn't include rivers like the Main Stem Colorado or the Main Stem Green River. Um, anything with large annual flows that are very unlikely to go intermittent. So we focused on small streams, and we focused on streams that had minimal impacts from dams, diversions, um, and, and human use. So we tried to select streams that were relatively unimpacted, and we tried to uh, select streams that were across the whole basin and then included both uh, perennial and intermittent stream flow. And then we restricted our gauges to ones that had long, um, long enough stream records, so at least seven years of stream flow data. And then with these gauge records, we did a stream flow analysis on the historical data. And first, we modeled the relationship between flow metrics. So we extracted flow metrics from each record, such as mean flow, um, average low flows, low flow variability, um, we had a suite of seven different flow metrics, um, zero flow days. And then we modeled the relationship between those flow metrics and environmental variables, such as land cover type, soils, climate variables, um, and geology. And we built these models using conditional inference trees and random forests, which is a type of regression modeling. Then we used the random forest models uh, results from number one to then project stream flow metrics to ungaged reaches across the study area. So this way we could estimate stream flow metrics such as mean flow, low flows, zero flow days on ungaged reaches. We modeled perenniality, so we used the stream flow metrics to model which streams were perennial and which were not. And then we use the results from two and three to illustrate potential thresholds of stream intermittency under a, a future dry, uh, drying climate. So what we found is that for our landscape models, landscape variables associated with aridity, so unsurprisingly precipitation, PET is potential evapotranspiration, and percent snow were all um, some of the most important variables in predicting mean and minimum flow metrics. And that under drying conditions, perennial streams with high minimum flow CV, which stands for coefficient of variation, so high minimum flow CV, which indicates high variability of the stream flow, and lower mean flow per unit area will be at most risk of intermittency. So that's where we ended up focusing on for our thresholds of, of intermittency in the future. So this first the results from this first um, modeling effort to model stream flow metrics across the basin, we, have, we had a resulting set of maps, one for each stream flow metric across the basin, and we were able to put these up on the Colorado River Basin data portal through 
Colorado State University's geospatial centroid. So that's a mouthful, but basically um, CSU has a geospatial laboratory and they host a bunch of spatial data online and our data is um, up there as well. And so the, the website is here and you can, when you go to the website, this is what the page looks like when you get there. And then you can, um, over here on the right, in the lower right menu, you can select which flow metrics you want to look at. And then up here um, at the top in these menus, there are documents showing you, um, explaining more details about the metrics. And then if you zoom in to a given area, so this is, I'm zooming in around Moab here. These are stream reaches around Moab, and here I'm showing um, what our models identify uh, for intermittency, so um, which streams are perennial, which streams are intermittent, according to our models. Um, now again, these are, our models were based on historical data, so these model projections are current stream flow. What do we expect right now based on the historical data? These are not climate projections, they're just um, what would we expect right now. And then for the second piece, looking for th uh, thresholds, uh, hydrologic thresholds for these streams, um, these, are, this is, uh, these are results from a conditional inference tree model. And it's, um, it's pretty dense here, it's pretty complicated, but I want you to focus in on, these are model results for how to um, break down streams according to hydrology, so perenniality. And we had three categories, we had perennial, strongly intermittent and weakly intermittent. And the way that the model showed most significantly to break these streams down was um, on these thresholds of minimum flow coefficient of variation. So, so think of min CV as a, a measure of variability. And over here on this break, we have the most variable streams, which include strongly inter intermittent streams. So these are the driest streams over here, highly variable and very dry. And then slightly less dry, uh, going down this branch along this threshold, it breaks again at variability. And so we have, have low variability streams over here on this far left box. These are mostly, most of the perennial streams. So these have low variability. They're very predictable. Every year they have um, similar runoff, similar mean annual flows, similar low flows. Um, and then in between, we have streams that are moderately variable. So the, the cutoff, the threshold was 61% uh, minimum flow variability. And then this mean flow, mean specific flow, which is average flow uh, per unit area. And so what we found is that streams that have um, moderate variability and low flows were streams that included weakly intermittent streams mostly weekly intermittent streams. And these streams are likely to be the most vulnerable under drier conditions to shifting towards um, strongly intermittent. So these are the, the thresholds that we identified through this modeling effort. So um, variability above 61% and then mean flows less than 0.096 uh, per unit area. So what we were able to do with this threshold analysis was then come up with a map of, okay, which streams fall into this category of, of crossing this variability and mean flow threshold. And so what we were able to do is identify in red all the stream segments that had um, moderate variability and low mean flows, and then all the streams that fell outside that threshold were either on the very wet end of the spectrum so these are shown in green, or sort of like a yellow-green. I'm not sure exactly how it looks on your screen, but sort of a, a, a camouflage green here. And these streams are either very perennial or very intermittent, so they're not likely to, to change significantly in their hydrology. The very perennial streams are already um, quite wet, quite predictable, and then the, the strongly intermittent streams are already very dry. They, most of the year they're dry and they flow a little bit, most likely in response to um, to snow melt each year and, uh, and then in the southern part of the basin to monsoon uh, thunderstorms and rainstorms. But in between, uh, um, as identified by our thresholds, we found streams that are, are on the edge. These are streams that are uh, variable in their flow and they have lower mean annual flows and they tend to be at higher elevations, as you can see. So the, the gray line here is the, is the 7,500 foot contour line 
So you can see that most of the streams that we are labeling as threatened to shift towards intermittency are above 7,500 feet, so at their higher elevation, and they tend to be small streams. Um, so this, this was an interesting outcome. And all of these results are published in a paper that just came out this winter. So here's the citation for that paper. And it came out in the Journal of Hydrology, which is now available online. Now I'm going to shift towards talking more about riparian plant communities. So we wanted to know how do riparian, what are the consequences for these hydrologic changes to riparian plant communities? How do these plant communities shift along this gradient from wet to dry streams? And what does it mean for restoration and, and management of riparian areas? So we went out and we sampled 54 sites across the whole Upper Colorado River Basin. And we sampled streams along a gradient from perennial to intermittent. And then we stratified by hydro hydrology elevation groups. So we identified um, what we call hydro elevation groups. Um, and they went from dry to wet here. So our driest streams were intermittent streams at low elevations. And then moderately dry streams were uh, uh, perennial streams at low elevations. And then moderately wet were intermittent streams at high elevations. And then our wettest, wettest streams were perennial streams at high elevations. We had this gradient, four categories of hydro elevation groups, and we, and we stratified by that. So we had an equal number of sites in each of these categories. And they, uh, we attempted to represent the whole basin. And these were sites that were all on federal land, so uh, Forest Service, BLM, and Park Service lands. At each site, we established transects um, on this, across the stream, and we sampled riparian plant communities along uh, point intercept um, along transects. And then we also sampled the floodplain geomorphology, so the shape of the floodplain with respect to the channel. And we did a topographic survey of a bottomland cross section. So in that way, we could associate each plant community with a height away from the stream. So these are some results from our plant community analysis along these streams. Um, along the left axis, we have uh, frequency or cover of diff each, each type of plant. And then the bars represent the different kinds of sites. We have four hydro elevation categories. Um, here in black bars are the perennial high elevation streams. Gray bars are intermittent high elevation streams. Gray hatched bars are perennial low streams, and the white Hatched bars are intermittent low. So in each grouping, each plant category, um, from left to right, it gets it goes from wet to dry streams. So we had some some patterns pop out as significant. Uh, for total plant cover, the wettest streams had the most, and the driest streams had the least. That was a significant pattern. For annual streams. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't as strong as the total cover, but we did see an increase in annuals as, as you went drier across the sites. And then uh, for perennial plants, we also found a decrease from wet to dry. So wet streams had the most perennials, dry streams had the least perennials. Wetland species, as you might expect, decreased as you went from wet to dry. And then the, the, the last um, the strongest pattern was in native plants. So native plants were most abundant at the wettest streams, so the perennial high streams, and least abundant at the driest streams. So here again are just a summary of the significant patterns. Um, decreases in total as you total cover as you get drier, decreases in perennials as you get drier, decreases in native cover as you get drier. The only thing that increased as you got drier were the, um, the frequency and cover of annuals. The other categories of plants that we looked at um, did not have uh, strong or significant convincing patterns. So for, when we broke it down by forbs or grasses, shrubs, and trees, these patterns were not significant. There was quite a bit of variability. We also did a multivariate analysis of the plant communities at each site. So these are the results from a multivariate NMDS analysis of plant community composition. And each, in this plot, each uh, symbol represents a site. 
So you can think of each symbol as a plant community represented by a site. And again, I've broken down the symbols by hydro elevation type. So intermittent high elevation streams are um, black circles, intermittent low are gray circles, perennial high elevation streams are black triangles, perennial low are gray triangles. So elevation is broken down by color, so low streams are gray, black streams are um, black streams are high, excuse me, gray streams are low, black streams are high, and then intermittent streams are circles and perennial are, are triangles. And what we found here is you can see there's separation between the black and the gray. So there's separation between elevations, but not as much celebra uh, separation as between, um, not as much separation between the hydrologies. So you can see high elevation separates out there to the left, and the low elevation with the gray symbols separate out there to the right, um, but we didn't see as much separation between the hydrologies, between the intermittent and perennial streams. So stronger patterns by elevation. And then the last big take-home result from, from these plant community analysis was we put together um, a tool, the schematic of the characteristic species for each hydro elevation group. So this is a little complicated, but I'm going to walk you through it. So along the left axis, we have elevation. We have high elevation at the top here. These top boxes are the high elevation sites. And we have low elevation on the bottom. So these bottom boxes are low elevation. And then left to right, we have intermittent to perennial stream flow. So the left boxes are intermittent, and the right boxes are perennial. So as you move towards the left, lower corner, you get drier, and then vice versa. As you move to the right, you get wetter. As you move up, you get wetter. And so in each box, I have um, what we pulled out as a, as a, for a characteristic species analysis, which were the most characteristic species of each of these hydro elevation types of sites. And so this could be used as a, as a restoration tool if we, for example, if we are working in a perennial <coughs> low elevation Stream. Here are here are some typical plants in a perennial low elevation stream among the sites we sampled, and um, down close to the stream channel we found very wet species like Juncus balticus and Salix exigua down here, and then up as you moved away up higher we found Atriplex stridentata and more um, drier, more xeric loving species. So, for example, say we're doing a, a restoration project at a low a low elevation perennial stream and we're falling into this this category. And the projections for this region are to get drier. And so if we're, if we're going to be planting seeds, if we're going to be doing transplants, pole plantings of, of riparian plants in this site, we can look to what's currently growing there, but we might also want to look to nearby sites that are drier. So on this schematic, we would move then to drier sites, which would be to the left. So we would look to nearby streams that are um, intermittent. So these are streams that are at the same elevation but that are intermittent, so slightly drier on the spectrum, and they host um, slightly different species. So we went, in addition to planting species that we already find at this kind of site, we might want to also add in some drier loving species that may persist more long term as the climate shifts drier. So this schematic could be used uh, if you have an example site at any, any one of these types of sites and then to look drier to a drier place on the spectrum to also choose additional species for supplementing a given restoration project. So you can follow the arrows to drier sites through the schematic. So in summary, we found that under drying conditions, total abundance and cover will decrease as you move from wet to dry. Annual plants will increase and perennials will decrease, and native plants will decrease. We found that differences between communities among elevation groups were more distinct than differences between perennial and intermittent streams. So that was interesting and, and somewhat surprising to us. And what that leads us to believe is that the direct effects of climate that dominate across elevational gradients, so things like length of winter, growing degree, degree days, um, mean annual temperature, these kind of direct climate effects that you see across elevations 
will determine the most dramatic changes in plant community composition. While changes in stream hydrology may drive more subtle changes. And that this has implications for restoration. So if, if our sites are going to be, over the next 50 to 100 years, are going to be, get significantly drier, we can look to neighboring streams and neighboring um, analog streams to pull ideas for species that will do well in drier conditions. So that's the end of the results that I have to show today, but I wanted to talk briefly about potential future directions for this line of work. In terms of our hydrologic analysis, um, some future directions we could take it would be to put the models that we've already built, put those models to work with future climate projections to forecast future stream flow metrics. So currently those maps I showed you show current stream flow as we understand it. Our models are built on historic data, and so, so our models can only speak to what's currently going on on the landscape based on historic data. But the way that the models are built, we could um, then shift into future projections by plugging in future climate projections and then be able to forecast future stream flow metrics. So that's one way we, direction we could take it. Another, um, another thing we could do with future stream flow projections um, from our models will be to identify thresholds for, for future streams. So what are the thresholds in climate um, that might tip the balance for, for streams to move from intermittent to perennial, for example? What are some, what are some important thresholds? So that's, that's another um, place we could take this work. We sampled 54 sites for the plant communities across the basin, and that's quite a bit. 54 sites is a, is a good number, and we thought that represented the basin quite well, but it is a very large area. And so another thing that we could do in the future would be to sample more sites throughout the basin. That would broaden the scope of the vegetation work and, and basically make our understanding of the plant communities more robust by having more sites. And then it would be useful to also resample sites in additional years. So we had sampled in one year in uh, 2012, and if we were able to sample in additional years, that we could have the potential to look at variation between wet and dry years. So I'm going to end the end the presentation by asking you all, the audience, for any other ideas. What would be most useful for land managers, practitioners, policymakers, folks on the ground, and anyone who has questions about these kinds of systems and what they're going to look like in the future? What are some different things that we could do with these data and, and different directions that we could take it? With that, I'm going to thank my collaborators, Pat Shafros at the USGS Fort Collins Science Center and Leroy Poff in the Department of Biology here at Colorado State, um, and our funding sources, the Southern Rockies Landscape Conservation Cooperative grant through uh, Bureau of Reclamation's Water Smart Program, we also had a little bit of funding from USGS Climate Effects Network and their Invasive Species Program. I had a ton of field and logistical help from the Forest Service, BLM, National Park Service uh, for field site access. All of our field sites were on federal lands, and I had tremendous help from all the folks at those agencies. And then my field techs, Joel, Mark, and Jackie, and then assistance with um, some of my analyses, James Falcone, John Heasley, and Alex Chang. GIS and stream gauge analyses. So I'm just going to scroll back up and end on this ideas for future directions and open up for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. That was great. And also thanks for providing some food for thought uh, for us. So audience, uh, we'd like to ask you to um, ask questions if you're interested um, of, Liz, of Lindsay. Um, you have two options to ask these questions. You can either unmute yourself by pressing star six, and then um, you can you can talk, ask your question, or provide a comment. And then when you're done doing that, please remute mute yourself by pressing star six again. Or if you don't want to ask a question by phone, uh, feel free to type your question into that chat box and send it to me, the host, and I can um, fill the question to Lindsay. Also, if you haven't discovered the chat box, um, at the top center of your screen where it says viewing Lindsay Rendell's desktop, uh, you can click on that and, you're, and click on the chat box and it should um, open up for you to type questions in. So we do have some time uh, for questions, so 
while we, we can spend a little bit while you guys formulate some great things in your heads, and uh, and then we can um, go ahead. But if you have a question already and want to uh, either speak it by phone, that's great. You can just go ahead and press star six. We had a start of a question in the chat box, but Daniel, do you want to? Here we go. So Daniel asks, your analyses seem to seemed cor cor correlative. Have you done work with studying the transitions between types? So yeah, that's a good question. Um, Yes, so far we it's it's uh, it's been mostly correlative studies. So here, you know, identifying the hydrology of these different sites and then looking at patterns across the different hydrologies. We haven't done any kind of um, manipulative studies. For example, I'm thinking of trying to manipulate hydrology at a given site and then and then measure how the plant community responds. We haven't done anything like that. Um, another idea that I have been thinking about is to look at, analyze plant communities on sites that have are, have gone dry for other reasons, not climate change. So there are streams in the basin that have, um, their hydro hydrology has been altered due to diversions um, and water man management. So that those places could also be opportunities to look at, okay, this stream um, diversion started 50 years ago, and this is what the plant community looked like, or its diversion started 30 years ago, and this is, what, this is what the plant community looked like. So that would be another way to get at a more mechanistic look at it. But, um, but no, we haven't done anything like that yet. That would be another potential future direction. Thanks, Lindsay. We have another question in the chat box from Rebecca. Low variability in mean flow, at least at lower elevations, strongly suggests groundwater input. With increasing mm -hmm. demands on groundwater, perennial streams may be at higher risk than your climate-based models suggest. Are there ways to incorporate groundwater demand or aquifer recharge in your inter intermittency model? Yeah, so groundwater was something that we thought a lot about, and we, um, we wanted to incorporate it on the large-scale modeling effort. And the way that we tried to do that was by we had two different kind of, of geology layers. And we had, we had a bedrock geology and we had a surficial geology landscape variable. And we thought that those would be able to capture differences in, in, in groundwater uh, stream hydrology linkages. And with the models, the, 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 the geology actually did not come out as very important. And so that was surprising. And, and I think the groundwater is a piece where the, another potential future direction where we need to um, be able to quantify groundwater inputs on a large scale to be able to tie them into our models. And so um, I'm, a, I'm on the lookout for um, large-scale information on groundwater and ways to ways to incorporate that in a better way because the way we did it with the geology um, didn't come out as important for our models. All right, thanks. Uh, we do have another couple or one or more questions in the chat box. Are there any folks on the phone that want to type up and ask a question or provide any comments? If you do, you could do so now. All right, I'll go to the chat box question then. This is a question from Andy. The lower elevation scenario implies some shift, sorry, some shift towards invasive or exotic species such as tamarics. Have you considered the synergistic effects of these invasive species regarding reducing stream flows further as these invasives are often considered water hogs? Yeah, so that's an interesting angle. What we we were interested in the exotic versus native comparison, and so that's why we broke broke out those types of, of plants in our our analysis. And 
yeah, as you saw, the native cover decreases as, as things get drier, and that implies that the exotics have an advantage in some of these drier situations. And um, we do know that tamarisk and Russian olive um, tend to do perform quite well in drier situations, um, oftentimes better than than the native woody species. However, for water use, I would say in in places where you have both tamarisk and Russian olive and then the native woody plant, it's been shown that water use among these woody species, regardless of whether they're exotic or native, is, is, is similar. So if you're, replacing, if you're replacing tamarisk with cottonwood, the water use is going to be similar. So the impact on the, on the stream flow or, or spring discharge are going to be similar. Um, if you're taking out woody vegetation, uh, and you're replacing it with grasses and forbs, and yes, that will potentially um, help the stream hydrology. But it's it's a really hard way to increase removing plants is a hard way to to increase stream flows. So th the tamarisk question, I think, um, it's it, it's complicated, and it's also complicated by the fact that tamarisk stands across the region are. Um, are dying back due to the tamarisk beetle are starting to die back. And so I think long term into the future, tamarisk is going to become less of an important player on the landscape. Um, however, Russian olive is continuing to increase on the landscape. So Russian olive may be more of a, 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 an important woody plant uh, player in the future. And um, looking at its water use might be interesting, but again, I think. I think the the research has shown that if you're talk if you're comparing woody species, whether it's um, in, exotic or native, the the water use is usually similar. Thanks, Lindsay. So we do have a few more minutes for any last minute questions, uh, folks. Um, anybody on the phone want to press star st six and ask a question or provide any comments? Right. Um, I don't have any other questions in the queue, so maybe we should wrap things up. And uh, Lindsay, do you have any final comments or resources or anything that you'd like to share with the audience? Well, I'd just like to say thanks for tuning in, and I think my contact information is uh, is up on the Southern Rockies LCC website. So if you have any further questions, feel free to contact me. Great. Thanks, Lindsay. For those of you who joined late, uh, we'll have a recording of this webinar as well as a PDF of Lindsay's slides um, on the Southern Rockies LCC website. I hope to have that up within a week. And that's all I have to say. Um, again, any more last minute questions, we can hold on for another 30 seconds and see if anybody wants to ask a question. And also, if you folks are interested in hearing about um, other opportunities and events with the Southern Rockies LCC, um, you can go to the website southernrockieslcc.org and subscribe to um, our mailing list, and that way um, you'll be informed of upcoming events and resources. We don't send it out. We don't. Um, we're trying to do like quarterly new newsletters and then occasional announcements, so we don't send out a lot of information. So it won't be too overwhelming. Um, but just keep that in mind, and also share that with your colleagues and your staff. All right, then, um, I'll just wrap things up. Again, thank you, Lindsay, so much for your excellent information. And I'd like to thank all you participants for uh, being on the webinar today. And just want to wish everybody uh, to have a great day. And um, hopefully we'll see you on our next webinar, which we'll, we're trying to um, get some scheduled for August and September and then later in the fall. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.